when only Jehovah's back was seen. He also concludes the age of belief when in vagueness God was perceived. The The Essence of the Flesh Inhabited by God The first incarnate God lived upon the earth for thirty-three and a half years. Yet he performed his ministry for only three and a half of those years. Both during the time he worked and before he began his work, he was possessed of normal humanity. He inhabited his normal humanity for 33 and a half years. Throughout the last three and a half years, he revealed himself to be the incarnate God. Before he began performing his ministry, he appeared with ordinary, normal humanity, showing no sign of his divinity and it was only after he began formally performing his ministry that his divinity 
was made manifest. His life and work during those first 29 years all demonstrated that he was a genuine human being, a son of man, a flesh. For his ministry only began in earnest after the age of 29. The meaning of incarnation is that God appears in the flesh and he comes to work among man of his creation in the image of a flesh. So, for God to be incarnated, he must first be flesh, flesh with normal humanity. This, at the very least, must be true. In fact, the implication of God's incarnation is that God lives and works in the flesh. God in his very essence becomes flesh, becomes a man. His incarnate life and work can be divided into two stages. First is the life he lives before performing his ministry. He lives in an ordinary human family, in utterly normal humanity, obeying the normal morals and laws of human life, with normal human needs, food, clothing, shelter, sleep, normal human weaknesses, and normal human emotions. In other words, during this first stage, he lives in non-divine, completely normal humanity, engaging in all the normal human activities. The second stage is the life he lives after beginning to perform his ministry. He still dwells in the ordinary humanity with a normal human shell showing no outward sign of the supernatural. Yet he lives purely for the sake of his ministry. And during this time, his normal humanity exists entirely in service of the normal work of his divinity. For by then, his normal humanity has matured to the point of being able to perform his ministry. So the second stage of his life is to perform his ministry in his normal humanity, is a life both of normal humanity and of complete divinity. The reason that during the first stage of his life, he lives in completely ordinary humanity is that his humanity is not yet equal to the entirety of the divine work, is not yet mature. Only after his humanity grows mature becomes capable of shouldering his ministry, can he set about performing his ministry. Since he, as flesh, needs to grow and mature, the first stage of his life is that of normal humanity. While in the second stage, because his humanity is capable of undertaking his work and performing his ministry, the life the incarnate God lives during his ministry is one of both humanity and complete divinity. If from the moment of his birth, the incarnate God began his ministry in earnest, performing supernatural signs and wonders, then he would have no corporeal essence. Therefore, his humanity exists for the sake of his corporeal essence. There can be no flesh without humanity, and a person without humanity is not a human being. In this way, the humanity of God's flesh is an intrinsic property of God's incarnate flesh. To say that when God becomes flesh, he is entirely divine, is not at all human, is a blasphemy, because this is an impossible stance to take one that violates the principle of incarnation. Even after he begins to perform his ministry, his divinity still inhabits the human outer shell when he does his work. It is just that at the time, his humanity serves the sole purpose of allowing his divinity to perform the work in the normal flesh. So the agent of the work is the divinity inhabiting his humanity. It is his divinity, not his humanity, at work, 
Yet it is a divinity hidden within his humanity. His work is in essence done by his complete divinity, not by his humanity. But the performer of the work is his flesh. One could say that he is a man and also is God. For God becomes a God living in the flesh, with a human shell and a human essence, but also the essence of God. Because he is a man with the essence of God, he is above any of created humans, above any man who can perform God's work. And so, among all those with a human shell like his, among all those who possess humanity, only he is the incarnate God himself. All others are created humans. Though they all have humanity, created humans are nothing but human, while God incarnate is different. In his flesh, he not only has humanity, but more importantly, has divinity. His humanity can be seen in the outer appearance of his flesh and in his everyday life, but his divinity is difficult to perceive. Because his divinity is expressed only when he has humanity and is not as supernatural as people imagine it to be, it is extremely difficult for people to see. Even today, it is most difficult for people to fathom the true essence of the incarnate God. In fact, even after I have spoken about it at such length, I expect it is still a mystery to most of you. This issue is very simple. Since God becomes flesh, His essence is a combination of humanity and divinity. This combination is called God Himself, God Himself on Earth. The life that Jesus lived on Earth was a normal life of the flesh. He lived in the normal humanity of His flesh. His authority to do God's work and speak God's word, or to heal the sick and cast out demons, to do such extraordinary things, did not manifest itself, for the most part, until he began his ministry. His life before age 29, before he performed his ministry, was proof enough that he was just a normal flesh. Because of this, and because he had not yet begun to perform his ministry, people saw nothing divine in him, saw nothing more than a normal human being, an ordinary man, as when at first some people believed him to be Joseph's son. People thought that he was the son of an ordinary man, had no way of telling that he was God's incarnate flesh. Even when, in the course of performing his ministry, he worked many miracles, most people still said that he was Joseph's son, for he was the Christ with the outer shell of normal humanity. His normal humanity and his work both existed in order to fulfill the significance of the first incarnation, proving that God had entirely come into the flesh, become an utterly ordinary man. That he had normal humanity before he began his work was proof that he was an ordinary flesh. And that he worked afterward also proved that he was an ordinary flesh. For he performed signs and wonders, healed the sick and cast out demons in the flesh with normal humanity. The reason that he could work miracles was that his flesh bore the authority of God, was the flesh in which God's spirit was clothed. He possessed this authority because of the spirit of God, and it did not mean that he was not a flesh. Healing the sick and casting out demons was the work that he needed to perform in his ministry, an expression of his divinity hidden in his humanity. And no matter what signs he showed or how he demonstrated his authority, 
He still lived in normal humanity and was still a normal flesh. Up to the point that he was resurrected after dying upon the cross, he dwelt within a normal flesh. Bestowing grace, healing the sick, and casting out demons were all part of his ministry, were all work he performed in his normal flesh. Before he went to the cross, he never departed from his normal human flesh, regardless of what he was doing. He was God himself, doing God's own work. Yet because he was the incarnate flesh of God, he ate food and wore clothing, had normal human needs, had normal human reason and a normal human mind. All of this was proof that he was a normal man, which proved that God's incarnate flesh was a flesh with normal humanity, not a supernatural one. His job was to complete the work of God's first incarnation, to fulfill the ministry of the first incarnation. The significance of incarnation is that an ordinary, normal man performs the work of God himself. That is, that God performs his divine work in humanity and thereby vanquishes Satan. Incarnation means that God's spirit becomes a flesh. That is, God becomes flesh. The work that he does in the flesh is the work of the spirit, which is realized in the flesh, expressed by the flesh. No one except God's flesh can fulfill the ministry of the incarnate God. That is, only God's incarnate flesh, this normal humanity, and no one else can express the divine work. If during his first coming, God had not had the normal humanity before the age of 29, if as soon as he was born, he could work miracles, if as soon as he learned to speak, he could speak the language of heaven. If the moment he first set foot upon the earth, he could apprehend all worldly matters, discern every person's thoughts and intentions, then he could not have been called a normal man, and his flesh could not have been called human flesh. If this had been the case with Christ, then the meaning and the essence of God's incarnation would have been lost. That he possessed normal humanity proves that he was God incarnated in the flesh. The fact that he underwent a normal human growth process further demonstrates that he was a normal flesh. And moreover, his work is sufficient proof that he was God's word, God's spirit, becoming flesh. God becomes flesh because of the needs of the work. In other words, this stage of work needs to be done in the flesh, done in normal humanity. This is the prerequisite for the Word becoming flesh, for the Word appearing in the flesh, and is the true story behind God's two incarnations. People may believe that Jesus' entire life was accompanied by wonders, that up until the end of his work on earth, he did not manifest normal humanity, that he did not have normal human needs or weaknesses or human emotions, did not require the basic necessities of life or entertain normal human thoughts. They simply imagine him to have a superhuman mind a transcendent humanity. They believe that since he is God, he should not think and live as normal humans do, that only a normal person, a bona fide human being, can think normal human thoughts and live a normal human life. These are all man's ideas and man's notions, which run counter to the original intentions of God's work. Normal human thinking sustains normal human reason and normal humanity. Normal humanity sustains the normal functions of the flesh 
and the normal functions of the flesh enable the normal life of the flesh in its entirety. Only by working in such flesh can God fulfill the purpose of His incarnation. If the incarnate God possessed only the outer shell of the flesh, but did not think normal human thoughts, then this flesh would not possess human reason, much less bona fide humanity. How could a flesh like this, without humanity, fulfill the ministry that the incarnate God ought to perform? Normal mind sustains all aspects of human life. Without a normal mind, one would not be human. In other words, a person who does not think normal thoughts is mentally ill. And a Christ who has no humanity but only divinity cannot be said to be God's incarnate flesh. So how could God's incarnate flesh have no normal humanity? Is it not blasphemy to say that Christ has no humanity? All activities that normal humans engage in rely on the functioning of a normal human mind. Without it, humans would behave aberrantly. They would be unable to tell the difference between black and white, good and evil. And they would have no human ethics and moral principles. Similarly, if the incarnate God did not think like a normal human, then he would not be a bona fide flesh, a normal flesh. Such non-thinking flesh would not be able to take on the divine work. He would not be able to engage in the normal activities of the flesh, much less live together with humans on earth. And so the significance of God's incarnation, the very essence of God's coming into the flesh, would have been lost the humanity of God incarnate exists to maintain the normal divine work in the flesh. His normal human thinking sustains his normal humanity and all his normal corporeal activities. One could say that his normal human thinking exists in order to sustain all the work of God in the flesh. If this flesh did not possess a normal human mind, then God could not work in the flesh, and what He needs to do in the flesh could never be accomplished. Though the incarnate God possesses a normal human mind, His work is not adulterated by human thought. He undertakes the work in the humanity with a normal mind, under the precondition that He possesses the humanity with a mind, not by the exercise of normal human thought. No matter how lofty the thoughts of his flesh are, his work does not bear the stamp of logic or thinking. In other words, his work is not conceived by the mind of his flesh, but is a direct expression of the divine work in his humanity. All of his work is the ministry he needs to fulfill, and none of it is conceived by his brain. For example, Healing the sick, casting out demons, and the crucifixion were not products of his human mind, could not have been achieved by any man with a human mind. Likewise, the conquering work of today is a ministry that must be performed by the incarnate God, but it is not the work of a human will. It is the work his divinity should do, work of which no fleshly human is capable. So the incarnate God must possess a normal human mind, must possess normal humanity, because he must perform his work in the humanity with a normal mind. This is the essence of the work of the incarnate God, the very essence of the incarnate God.
I hope you return soon. Now then, Eastern Lightning is the only church in the world that witnesses his return. And on the basis of the work of redemption, he also does the work of judgment, starting with God's house. And he has come to purify, save, and perfect mankind, bring people into God's kingdom. Revelation also says, he that has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Amen. Amen. We should look into it further. That's right. We can't miss this opportunity. That's right. right. Almighty God says, the work of judgment is God's own work, so it must naturally be done by God himself. Only God is qualified to and in the position to judge man. God incarnate, doing the work of judgment in the last days is necessary. Now I understand why God is incarnated to do the work. I feel enlightened. The Lord would return to do the work of judgment in the last days. I have no objection to that. However, I have one question. Go ahead. Why does God have to do the work of judgment during the last days through incarnation? Yes, yes that's a why is he incarnated? During the age of law, God used Moses to work. Can't God also use man to do his judgment work in the last days? Yes. yes. I don't understand it, so please explain. Will you please fellowship with us again? Yes. Brother Lin, that's quite important, your question. I'd like to talk about it. Good question. He's right. Yes, it's a very good question indeed. Yeah. Keep this in mind. We shall not forget. The Lord Jesus will take us into the kingdom of heaven. That's he won't right. be incarnated to do the work of judgment. Amen. Amen. Right. When Jesus returns, he can't become flesh. Amen. You say it's impossible for God to become flesh? Is that for us to decide? When the Lord Jesus came to earth, people didn't acknowledge him or accept him because he was not named Messiah, but the Lord Jesus was Messiah. Isn't it a fact? How do you explain that? God's incarnation is a mystery. In it, there is God's will, disposition, and his almightiness and wisdom. Mm, yes. It is true that the Lord Jesus was nailed to the cross, but think of this. What is the meaning of his death? His crucifixion is what redeemed all of mankind. And God gained glory. Wasn't it God's wisdom? Can you fathom that? Who can fathom God's work? God's thoughts are always higher than mankind's. All of God's ways are higher than man's ways. God's wisdom can't be fathomed by man. In everything God does, there are mysteries, which is beyond mankind's thoughts. Mm -hmm. People think that by biblical letters and words, their notions and imaginations, they are capable of perceiving God's mysteries and wisdom. Aren't they too arrogant? God created the heavens, earth, and all things. God rules over everything. So as we all know, in God's first incarnation, he was an ordinary man. His name, Jesus. Was this in accord with man's conceptions? Who thought of that? Who figured it out? No one figured it out. Yes. Yes. Before God does his work, no one can predict how he'll come or predict how he'll work. We just don't know. People stubbornly try to define God's work with their own imaginations. They're really reckless and ignorant. All right, everyone, let's calm down. Let's listen to the brothers from the Church of Almighty God. Okay, you may continue. Thank you. Brother, your question is quite practical. Yes. About why God must be incarnated to do the work of judgment in the last days. Most believers who seek the truth in God's appearance care the most about it. It also 
relates to whether man can be taken into the kingdom of heaven. So, it's very important to understand this truth. Why must God do the work of judgment through incarnation and not by the use of man? It's determined by the nature of the work of judgment. Mm. For the work of judgment is God expressing the truth and his righteous disposition to conquer, purify, and save man. Let's read Almighty God's words. Almighty God says, The work of judgment is God's own work, so it must naturally be done by God himself. It cannot be done by man in his stead, because judgment is the conquering of man through the truth. It is unquestionable that God still appears as the incarnate image to do this work among men. That is to say, in the last days, Christ shall use the truth to teach men around the earth and to make all truths known to them. This is God's work of judgment. In the last days, Christ uses a variety of truths to teach man, reveal the essence of man, and dissect his words and deeds. These words comprise various truths, such as man's duty, how man should obey God, how man should be loyal to God, how man ought to live out the normal humanity, as well as the wisdom and disposition of God, and so on. These words are all focused on the essence of man and his corrupt disposition. In particular, those words that reveal how man spurns God are spoken in regard to how man is an embodiment of Satan and an enemy force against God. When God does the work of judgment, he does not simply make clear the nature of man with just a few words, but carries out revelation, dealing, and pruning over the long term. Such manner of revelation, dealing, and pruning cannot be substituted with ordinary words, but with the truth that man does not possess at all. Only such manner of work is deemed judgment. Only through such judgment can man be persuaded, be thoroughly convinced into submission to God, and gain true knowledge of God. What the work of judgment brings about is man's understanding of the true face of God and the truth about his rebelliousness. The work of judgment allows man to gain much understanding of the will of God, of the purpose of God's work, and of the mysteries that could not be understood by man. It also allows man to recognize and know his corrupt substance and the roots of his corruption, as well as to discover the ugliness of man. These effects are all brought about by the work of judgment. For the substance of such work is actually the work of opening up the truth, way, and life of God to all those who have faith in Him. This work is the work of judgment done by God. From Almighty God's words we know, God's work of judgment in the last days is to express a variety of truths. God's disposition, what God has and is, and to reveal all the mysteries, is to judge man's satanic nature of resisting and betraying God, to reveal and dissect their words and deeds, and illustrate to man his holy and righteous substance, his intolerance of offense. In the judgment of God's word, God's chosen people are revealed and judged as if they're face to face with him. To judge mankind, God must make all of them see his righteous disposition, which makes man seemingly see God's holy substance and the great light that comes from heaven. And mankind sees God's words pierce their hearts like a double-edged sword, and they suffer badly by that. Only in this way can they know their corrupt substance and true situation. They feel ashamed, disgraced to show their faces. They fully fall down before God and repent to Him. Then they can accept truth and be a man by God's word, thus escaping from Satan's influence and being saved and perfected by God.
To do the work of judging and purifying and saving all mankind, God needs to do it in person, through incarnation. Yes, we've experienced the judgment of Almighty God's words and tasted that His holy and righteous disposition is intolerant of man's offense. Every word of God is holy and majestic. It pierces our hearts, our satanic nature that resists and betrays God, and even our corrupt disposition, deep within which we can't perceive, are revealed thoroughly. We've come to realize that our nature is full of arrogance and conceit. We're full of contempt. We're selfish, crooked, and crafty. When we live according to these things, we're living like ghosts. Without any human likeness, we are hateful to God. We're all ashamed and regretful. When we discover our evil and baseness, we don't deserve to live in God's presence. We fall before God, willing to accept His salvation. It is when we experience the judgment of Almighty God's words that we truly see God's appearance. God's holiness cannot be defiled. Righteousness not offended. We understand God's kind intentions of saving man, His love for man. We see our substance being corrupted by Satan. We then have a sincere reverence for God. We readily accept the truth, obey all God's arrangements. Our corrupt disposition will gradually be cleansed. Therefore, only if the God incarnate does His work of judgment by expressing the truth, God's righteous disposition, and what God has and is, can we see the appearance of the mm -hmm. true light and appearance of God. And thus people can gain a true knowledge of God and can be purified and be saved. No one except Christ can judge us and do the work of judgment in the last days. Let's have a look at Almighty God's words. Almighty God says, No one is more suitable and qualified than God in the flesh. For the work of judging the corruption of man's flesh, Satan can only be fully defeated if God in the flesh judges the corruption of mankind. Being the same as man possessed of normal humanity, God in the flesh can directly judge the unrighteousness of man. This is the mark of his innate holiness and of his extraordinariness. Only God is qualified to and in the position to judge man, for he is possessed of the truth and righteousness and so he is able to judge man. Those who are without the truth and righteousness are not fit to judge others. Only because of these judgments do you see that God is a righteous God, that God is a holy God. Only because of his holiness and his righteousness does he judge you and pour wrath upon you, that he can reveal his righteous disposition when seeing man's disobedience and his holiness when seeing man's filthiness shows that he is God himself, holy and unblemished, despite living in a land of filth. If a man wallows in the mire with others, without holiness or righteous disposition, he would be unqualified to judge others' unrighteousness or make any other judgment upon them. If a man judges others, does he not strike his own face? How can a man who is unclean be qualified to judge others who are also unclean? Only God himself, who is holy, can judge the impure mankind. How can man judge others' sin? How can man see others' sin and be qualified to condemn others? If God were unqualified to judge man's sins, how could he be the righteous God himself? When man displays his corrupt disposition, God speaks and judges you, and in this way you see that he is holy. These words are so practical. Can't God judge people by using man? From Almighty God's words, it's clear that to do the work of judgment in the last days, God must do it by expressing his truth disposition, almightiness, and wisdom, so as to conquer, purify, 
and perfect man. This work of judgment is the work God personally appears to do, as well as the work of opening and ending an age. All this work must be done by the God incarnate. No one else can do God's work. That's right. God in substance is the truth, the way, and the life. God's disposition is holy, intolerant of offense. However, man is deeply corrupted by Satan, full of its disposition. They're not compatible with God. Therefore, people find it hard to accept the work of God incarnate. They won't investigate. They take the work of those they adore and blindly believe in them. They believe that as God's work and they accept it. That causes a problem. Obviously, people just don't know what it means to believe in God or to experience God's work. Therefore, during the last days, God must become flesh to express the truth and to solve all the problems of corrupt mankind. Regarding the question, why doesn't God use man to do the work of judgment? Isn't that obvious? Man's substance is man. Man does not possess the divine substance. Man can't express the truth, God's disposition, or what God has and is. Man is incapable of saving mankind. Yes. Besides, man is corrupted by Satan and has sinful nature. How could he be qualified to judge others? Man is totally corrupt. They can't cleanse or save themselves. They don't know how. How could they possibly cleanse and save yes. others? If man is the judge, no one would be convinced. They'd bring disgrace to themselves. Only God is holy and righteous, and only God is the truth, the way, the life. So God's judgment in the last days must be done by the God incarnate. No one else can do that. This is a fact. Everyone, can't we understand that? That's right. If God used corrupt man to do the work of judgment, what would be the result? It would be a lot worse. Then why did God use man? To do the work in the age of law? Because the work was different from the work of judgment in the last days. Those in the age of law were a newborn human race, shallowly corrupted by Satan. So the work done by Jehovah was only to issue the commandments to lead and guide the people living on earth. The change of man's disposition didn't involve that stage of work. God didn't need to express more truths. He only needed to use man to convey the laws he issued to the Israelites. What he wanted them to know was to abide by the laws and to worship Jehovah. He wanted them to live a normal life. Then that work was completed. So by using Moses, God could just get the work done at that time. He didn't need to be incarnated to work personally. Yes. Mm. However, That's God's right. work of judgment in the last days is to save the corrupted mankind. It can't be achieved by expressing. Just a few pieces are conveying some laws. Yes. God has to express many truths. God has to fully express his inherent disposition and what he has and is, and open up the truth, the way, and the life to man. Man feels as if God appears to them face to face, making them understand the truth and know God, thereby purifying and perfecting humans thoroughly. This requires God to be incarnated, do it personally. No one else can do it. It's all right for God to use prophets to convey pieces of God's word, but God won't allow prophets to express his disposition, to express what he has and is, or to express all of his truths. Man's not qualified. If God used men to express all his dispositions and all his truths, it would easily shame God. Man has a corrupt disposition and will express human notions and has impurity in working. That would easily bring shame to God and affect the result of his work. Man has mixtures in working. Man cannot express the truth on God's behalf. Yes. What shames God are impurities. That's right. So then, if God used man to express his disposition and all his truths, due to man's impurities, Others would not be convinced, but would even resist it. 
Satan would find fault and accuse it, stirring up man's hatred for God, and they'd establish their own kingdom. It's the consequence of man doing God's work. During the last days, when God incarnate saves the corrupted mankind, people would hardly accept and obey the work of God. It'd be harder for man to accept and obey if God used man to do the work. Isn't that a fact? Let's look at religious pastors and elders and see how they resist and condemn the work of God incarnate. Is there any difference between them and the Jewish chief priests and the Pharisees who resisted Lord Jesus? God's work of saving corrupt mankind is really difficult. We should understand God's heart. Yes. Yes. I understand your fellowship. The age of law was meant to issue laws and show how the people should live. God could use man in order to make the laws known to the Israelites. But God's judgment work in the last days is to save people and cleanse people by expressing the truth and God's disposition. This work just can't be done by man. Yes. It definitely has to be done by God incarnate. Thanks be to God. It also shows God's love for all of us. Yes. yes. Man has no truth and is totally corrupt. If man judged people, no one would be convinced. Mm. Yes. It makes it more difficult for man to accept God's work. Mm. God incarnate, doing the work of judgment in the last days is necessary. Now I understand why God is incarnated to do the work I feel enlightened. Thanks be to God. Man was created by God. Only God understands man. How can we be free of sins? How can we become holy? I think that people don't really know. Only God knows best how to purify man and to save them. Yes. God expressing the truth to save man and judge man can't be done by us humans. Yes, of course, that's right. God incarnate doing judgment work in the last days makes the most sense. Yes. God becomes flesh to do the judgment work in the last days. On one hand, to judge us, purify us, and save us. However, it is more important to completely express God's disposition and what God has and is by expressing truth. God will enable mankind to truly understand Him and know Him, and see God appearing in the flesh. Yes. Let's read Almighty God's Word, page 1351. Almighty God says, For all of those who live in the flesh, changing their disposition requires goals to pursue, and knowing God requires witnessing the real deeds and the real face of God. Both can only be achieved by God's incarnate flesh. And both can only be accomplished by the normal and real flesh. This is why the incarnation is necessary and why it is needed by all corrupt mankind. Since people are required to know God, the images of the vague and the supernatural gods must be dispelled from their hearts. And since they are required to cast off their corrupt disposition, they must first know their corrupt disposition. If only man does the work so as to dispel the images of the vague gods from people's hearts, then he will fail to achieve the proper effect. The images of the vague gods in people's hearts cannot be exposed, cast off, or completely expelled by words alone. In doing so, Ultimately, it would still not be possible to dispel these deep-rooted things from people. Only the practical God and the true image of God can replace these vague and supernatural things to allow people to gradually know them. And only in this way can the due effect be achieved. Page 1351. Meng Fu, would you read it? Okay. Only God himself can do his own work, and no one else can do this work on his behalf. No matter how rich the language of man is, 
he is incapable of articulating the reality and normality of God. Man can only know God more practically and can only see him more clearly if God personally works among man and completely shows forth his image and his being. This effect cannot be achieved by any fleshly man. Man's imaginings are, after all, empty and cannot replace the true face of God. The inherent disposition of God and the work of God himself cannot be impersonated by man. The invisible God in heaven and his work can only be brought to earth by God incarnate who personally does his work among man. This is the most ideal way in which God appears to man, in which man sees God and comes to know the true face of God, and it cannot be achieved by a non-incarnate God. The incarnate God brings to an end the age when only the back of Jehovah appeared to mankind, and also concludes the age of mankind's belief in the vague God. In particular, the work of the last incarnate God brings all mankind into an age that is more realistic more practical and more pleasant. He not only concludes the age of law and doctrine, more importantly, he reveals to mankind a God who is real and normal, who is righteous and holy, who unlocks the work of the management plan and demonstrates the mysteries and destination of mankind, who created mankind and brings to an end the management work, and who has remained hidden for thousands of years he brings the age of vagueness to a complete end. He concludes the age in which the whole of mankind wished to seek God's face, but was unable to see. He ends the age in which the whole of mankind served Satan and leads the whole of mankind all the way into a completely new era. All this is the outcome of the work of God in the flesh instead of God's spirit. <laughs> It's very significant for God incarnate to do judgment work in the last days. God becomes flesh and lives among us on earth, interacts with mankind, utters words to humans. He makes known to the public God's disposition, what God has and is, which people God likes, which kind God dislikes, with whom God will get angry, whom God will punish, God's emotional state, God's requirements, God's will for all mankind. The outlook on life that man shall have are all made known to man. Yes. Mankind has accurate goals and pursuits. They all needn't go searching in a vague belief. The appearance of God incarnate brings to an end the age when only the back of Jehovah appeared to mankind and ends the age when mankind believed in a vague mm. God. Sounds very Let's practical. See. Interesting. Everyone who's experienced Almighty God's work in the last days has the exact same feeling. Though we have experienced God's judgment in the last days and all manners of trials, suffered the great red dragon's frenzied hunting, cruel persecution, all sufferings, we then see God's righteous disposition upon all of us. We see God's majesty and wrath, God's almightiness and wisdom and also see what God has and is revealed to all of us. We feel as if we've seen God. Yeah, so interesting. We feel as if we're face to face with him. Hence, we all know him. All of us have reverence for him and can submit to his arrangements, obey him until death. We have seen God and known God practically in his work and his word, and we love him. Cast off our notions and our imaginations so we become ones who know God. For example, we believed that God was loving and compassionate, and God would forgive our sins forever. Yet in experiencing the judgment of Almighty God's words, we truly know God is not only compassionate and loving, but majestic, righteous, wrathful. Those who offend will be punished. We can revere God and accept the truth, be what He wants, during the last days, Almighty God's work of judgment makes all of us realize that God is righteous, intolerant of offense. We've tasted God's love and compassion for man 
we truly appreciate God's almightiness and wisdom. We get to know God's humility, His kind and thoughtful heart, and much of His loveliness. We see His emotions, His faithfulness, and His goodness, His sovereignty, authority, and His watching over everything. God reveals everything to us, what God has and is. It's as if we have seen God. Therefore, we all come to know God face to face and no longer believe according to our notions and imaginations. We have true reverence and adoration for Almighty God. We all obey and rely on God. Everyone truly realizes that if God wasn't personally incarnated to express the truth and judge, we would never truly know God or be delivered from sins and be holy. Yes. yes. So then, all things considered, God's work of judgment in the last days must be done by God incarnate in person. Mm -hmm. No one else can do it on his behalf. Praise to the Lord. Your understanding of God is practical. This shall be your achievement after experiencing the word and work of the incarnate Almighty God. Yes. Yes. Mm. It seems only if God is incarnated to show his disposition and true face to man, will we understand and have a practical knowledge of God. Mm. Yes. yes. Mm. Otherwise, we can only believe in God according to our notions and we will never have a true knowledge of God. Yes. This is enough to prove that only Christ is the truth, the way, the life. Only Christ can express the truth and God's disposition and can help us understand and to know God. 